Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Money Matters Top Tips for Success, where each and every day I bring on new business owners, entrepreneurs, and executives and have them share their top tips for success with you. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres to keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author of one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, moneymatterstoptips.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today I have Stanford Crane on the line, and he's founder over at Silicon Valley Incubator. Stanford, welcome back to the show. Hey, great to be with you, Adam. So um, I'm excited to do this episode. This is one of our very special Reunion 2020 episodes where I bring back a guest I had on um, back on in the past. And uh, today's guest, as I mentioned, is Stanford. And uh, we're going to get into today um, Plan 182 and its possible effects on communities in the immediate future. Um, but before we do that, Stanford, just to give people a little bit of a feel for um, what you're up to nowadays, um, l let's get a little bit further into what you're doing over at Silicon Valley Incubator. So tell us a little bit more about the company, please. Okay, that sounds great, Adam. Uh, what we do basically is incubate young companies primarily in the consumer space. Uh, they all have technology uh, components to them, but we try to make sure that they have two things. One, that they solve some need of the consumer because we have 70% of our economy is based on the consumer, and secondarily, that they have a business model that allows them to make money and, and I think this is, this is going to become increasingly I like important. the way you say that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. It's like you know, we, we just lived through the big WeWork meltdown and, uh, and, and the crushing of the, the SoftBank uh, next round of, of uh, funding because of the fact that they had raised $9 billion and never made a single penny of profit. And to me – I, I like companies that are in the incubator that are capital efficient or for my investments, I like them if they're capitally efficient. So so basically what we do is we say, look, you shouldn't have to raise a billion dollars to make a profit. I mean if you sure if you want to if you're building automobiles or something like that, mm -hmm. it's a big capex spend. But but I like things that are a little more efficient. So what we do in the incubator is we take ideas that can be launched uh, with a with a modest amount of capital and a modest amount, I mean, I'm not talking about you know a hundred thousand dollars. I'm I'm talking about you know up to tens of millions. But that if you if you launch them with tens of millions, you'll have multiples of that in revenue and and profit. So so that's kind of what the now the incubator is very stealthy. You, you can't go to our website because we don't want. Uh, our competitors or even VCs who say, hey, that's a great idea. I had to fund a company like that. So we're, we're very careful. We keep everything kind of under wraps until we, we launch. And one of the best examples of that is a company that we're launching here in 2020 that's been under development literally for years. And it was part of the reason why we came up with Plan 182, uh, and that's called World Moto Clash. And World Moto Clash is going to be – literally the reimagination of motorsports in America. And we all know there are things like NASCAR and IndyCar and Moto America and Supercross, but all of those uh, entities, in, in our view, were flawed. And they were flawed in many cases because of their history or in some cases because of other conflicts of interest. And we, we had a, a very interesting time trying to convince people to invest in this, even though within the first three years, the company will go of, of operation, you know, I'm talking about operating mm -hmm. our events, will go from $130 million in revenue and $60 million in operating profit to a, over a billion dollars in revenue. Wow. So, yeah, this is this is what we call hyper growth. And, and Oh, by the way, we do over 50% operating margin on that. So we do over $500 million in operating profit in year three. Yet I would talk to people and I would say you know, on Sand Hill Road here, they would be like, oh, that's not a, that's not a tech company. We, we can't fund that. And, and this is where I, you know, I mentioned in our, our last interview where I was talking to a fellow about Netflix and I said, oh, are they a tech company? He's like, oh, yeah, they're a tech company. Well, of course, we all know they're a media company. They're not a tech company. But anyway, what we're doing at World Motor Clash 
inspired me to think about uh, there are other companies out there that that are having these kind of problems where they don't fit into the little narrow niche. And if you look at it, I don't have the number exactly in front of me, but it was something like in the last three months, they funded 408 AI companies. Now, wow. this is, you know, you talk about groupthink. This yeah. is massive groupthink. And secondarily, it's like, it's I like the SaaS group. companies now from SaaS to AI. Yeah, it's, it's now AI. AI is the hot thing. And so it, it's kind of, uh, you know, a joke up here to me because I just had an experience where I was on the phone trying to get my AT&T uh, broadband fixed yesterday, <laughs> and they kept asking the same questions over and over again. I'm saying, I just told the last person this. Don't you use – so the concept of artificial intelligence, the old joke we used to use is, oh, yeah, we, we don't uh, – use artificial intelligence, we sell it. And so so this is kind of the the, the joke, if you will, that there, there's this massive group think going on. Do they actually think that there are going to be over a thousand successful AI companies? Apparently, but I can tell you it's not going to happen. So so from my standpoint, you know, knowing that group think in the funding space was was flawed on in Silicon Valley. And and the old and basically what happens is these people either went to Stanford or Harvard. They all read five same case studies. They all think exactly the same thing. They're, they're all so unsure of themselves and, and lacking in new ideas, that's why they're not entrepreneurs, that they go, oh, but uh, I funded it because Sequoia did it or, uh, you know, Lightspeed did it or, you know, you just fill in the blanks of the of the thousand VCs over there. So. The reason I came up with Plan 182, uh, unlike many entrepreneurs here in the Valley who only started companies in the Valley, I also started a company that's been profitable for over 25 years in Ohio. And, you know, I'm proud to say that they, they're still in existence and profitable making uh, components for Patriot Missile, Tomahawk, Cruise, Hellfire, Lantern, all of these military uh components that were supplied out of DESE, the Defense Electronic Supply Center in Dayton, Ohio. But when I started that company, Adam, I, it, I, it, was, it was impossible to get venture capital. Mm. So then I started my next company in Florida, and I started it right across the street from IBM because what I wanted to do, IBM was kind of stuck, in my view, in the computer area, and I wanted to get back into systems. So I started the Panda Project, which became the number one IPO of the year several years later. But I ran into the same problem of no venture investing in Florida. And so what I did with thinking about Plan 182, I'm saying, if it's bad in Ohio, in Florida, what is it like in the rest of the country? What's it like in, you know, Indiana? What's it like in Iowa? So I said, okay, let me come up with a plan that kind of relates to every, literally every congressional district in the United States. So I said, all right, let's start out with uh, three different levels of, of, uh, of investment. And the first level will be at every single congressional district in the country, my, I'm proposing, and I'll, I'll get to who I've proposed it to so far in the reaction this far, um, I'm proposing that we create one new consumer-oriented VC in every congressional district. That's 435 congressional districts. So when we do that, over a three-year period, they'll invest about $112 million. So the first year, every congressional district will, will form a new VC group, and they'll do it in a kind of a – away with local business leaders and the SBA and so forth, the congressperson. And and then they'll invest in any new business. Now, the flaw in the venture model today, there are many flaws, but the big, big flaw is they all need a liquidity event. Okay? And so they have things called sunset clauses where, oh, we have to get out of this thing, you know, at a certain time and so forth. Mm -hmm. So – that basically puts them in kind of a, a weird position of they'll say they have a billion-dollar fund. But what they don't tell you is the sunset clause is three years from now. They've already invested $300 million of it. They have to keep 
two times in reserve, so essentially they can't make any more investments. And that's where you come up with the, the uh, oft-used term zombie fund. They're simply zombies. And so people, you know, will pitch them and think they're going to get somewhere and they'll, uh, you know, the VCs will pretend to be important and then say, oh, well, you don't see that or you don't think you have the right team or whatever. And the reality is they're a zombie fund. And they're, and they're just simply intellectually dishonest on 90% of the time. Uh, I, I did actually run into, I won't mention the, <laughs> we won't mention the VC, but I did. Yeah, don't, 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 don't give me a trouble with names over here. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get you in trouble, but the, the funny thing, Adam, was I ran to a VC who actually admitted to me <laughs> that they were a zombie fund. And oh, said, wow. Thank you. I really appreciate that <laughs> because we can't invest anymore. We won't have time to get liquidity. So, so now think about this. We know that we have a consumer and services-based economy, right? Mm -hmm. So the only services you can get funded by a VC are software. Software as a service. That's, that's right. the old money. What if you have yep. a real services business? Like you want to ha open up a daycare center. You're not going to get funding. Two reasons. One, it doesn't fit their little profile. Number two, it doesn't have a big liquidity event. And so, to me, that that those are two major major flaws in in the model that we have today with venture capital. So, I said, okay, Plan 182. So we create a, a new. Uh, everybody out there can think of their own district. Uh, here's a new venture capital firm in the district. We're going to invest 25 million dollars in the first year into new businesses. Mm. Okay. So let's say you wanted to start a, you know, and, and what I'm trying to do here is also help people who are a little bit disadvantaged. And, and and I'm not helping them by saying, oh, you know, we'll give you a handout, we'll do this. We're going to give you access to the thing that's been keeping many of these people disadvantaged and that they do not have a, a, a way to get capital. And, and let's say you wanted to start a lawn care business. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you, you know, you've been a hard worker and you're working at Burger King or Thumbs or whatever, and you, you come in and you say, well, I'm, so I, I've saved up a little bit of money, but I, but I need to buy a truck and I need to buy some, some lawn mowers and some lawn care equipment and so forth. And you go to a bank and they say, great, what's the collateral that you have? What are you going to give me that's going to allow me to loan you money? Because if you're not in an uh, ongoing business, we're, we're not in that business of loaning you money. So now if you have, you know, <laughs> Twenty thousand dollars in cash that you can put up as a uh, as a some sort of a collateral. That's okay with them. But but the average person doesn't have that. So what my my Plan 182 does is they go to a Plan 182 venture capitalist, and the venture capitalist says, okay, well, let, let me you know talk to you about your business. Do you have any business experience? Well, I, I've been in the lawn care business, but I don't have business experience. Okay, let's match you up with some resources we have, and, and you can do this through the SBA or SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives, and match them up with people that know how to do this, and then match them up in a in kind of a pool where they have accountants who help these people do these business models. And maybe across all Plan 182, somebody's already done that, and they can show you how to do it. Man, so what is, uh, so the, the the interesting thing about this, Stamper, is that what you're saying is just highly logical. Yeah, like it just make it just makes sense. Yeah, it, it what it does basically is it it gives the most important commodity to mm -hmm. every person in every district in the country, and that is capital, mm -hmm. access to capital. Mm -hmm. And so, how did I come up with the name Plan 182? Well, there was a little bailout back in the financial crisis of a company called AIG, American mm -hmm. Insurance Group. And they got $182 billion from mm. the Fed to bail them out. And, 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 and in essence, to bail out people like Goldman Sachs who had put money into that, uh, the uh, collateralized debt obligations. Mm -hmm. So, what happened basically is they got something that the rest of the public can't get. So Wall Street got 182 billion, but Main Street and young people, you know, who were trying to start their own businesses 
they can't get access to that capital. So I called it Plan 182 because, in my view, if it's good enough for Wall Street, it's even better for Main Street. Hmm. And so, if and so you're where in, pro- Arkansas, where has this been proposed at so far? So you mentioned you've you've, you've had some action on it. Okay. Um, I won't mention the names because I don't want to get you, but I will tell yeah. you, I proposed it to the senators in California, their offices. Awesome. And several representatives in California that were on the Democratic side of the aisle, and I got the same response, and this is going to be shocking to you. We can't do anything as long as Trump is in the White House. Hmm. And I said, let me get this straight. You can't help out people in your district because you're afraid that it will look good for President Trump. Are you kidding me? And they're like, no, we're, we're just on hold on anything. And, and, and one of the groups, which is you know, right here in the Valley, said to me, mm-hmm. this would really be disruptive. And I said, disruption is good, isn't it? And, and the reality is that they didn't see it that way. Now, mm. I did propose it to someone at the White House, and uh, the person is a very capable person. Um, Unfortunately, she's a little lower in the food chain, and so she's trying to put everything together in the right form that it can be presented succinctly to Trump. And, and she feels that Trump's going to get it. Now, one of the things that which, which I mentioned to her, which is is a problem for Donald, is that the Donald came out of the asset-based lending world. So, in other words, he was building buildings. The bank goes great. We have, you know, senior position on the balance sheet on your building, and you have to pay us back. So, that's the old world. The new world is an asset-based. It's intellectual property and innovation-based. So the old asset-based banking system, the J.P. Morgan's, Chase's, Wells Fargo, they don't operate on intellectual property. They're like asset-based still. The VCs are somewhat intellectual property-based as long as it's tech. But as, as we said, and this is connecting all these dots, tech is a very small part of our $20 trillion economy. $14 trillion of that is consumer-based, and a tiny little spot of that is like software as a service and so forth. Even even uh, Netflix, you can't really call it a tech company. It's a media company. So so anyway, getting back to my, my thoughts, so we're going to see what, where this goes in the White House. But my, I, I can tell you, even, even with the the senators and Congress people here in California, the staff members got it. <laughs> of course, no, no, and that's why I don't, I don't think like the simplicity of my comment when I cut you off was that this just makes sense. So that's that's what worries me <laughs> is that it just makes so much sense. I know it, it, it is. It was startling to me that they would put politics. You know, we have we have. The biggest disparity between rich people and poor people here in in Santa Clara County, it's ridiculous. And people are moving out in droves because they literally cannot afford the homes here. And and we now have 15% of the population of the Bay Area. Get this, Adam. 15% drives over one and a half hours one way to work every day. So they're living out in the Central Valley. And it takes them an hour and a half to get to work one way and an hour and a half to get back. This is ridiculous. That's, that's a lot of years of life right there. That's yeah, a lot of years. And, and they, they can't afford to live here. So I said, okay. So is that say, why? I, I don't want to, I'm not saying this to be funny, but that might be why I have so many downloads over there. I think there's a, there's a huge amount of, of downloads that we get from, um, from that whole Bay Area. And I'm like, there's people in their cars. Never thought about it. That makes a lot of sense because I know people are working too. Um, that hour and yeah. a half commute. No way. That, that makes so much sense. Huh. Yeah, exactly. They're sitting in their car. I, I mean, the very typical thing at the MacArthur Maze will be, this is a maze yeah. of, roads around the in the East Bay as you're going across to get over to Silicon Valley. Literally, Adam, in this maze of roads when you're getting up to the toll plaza to go on the Bay Bridge, or it's the same on on uh, Dumbarton or any of the other ones, 
but but on the on the maze there, a very typical time, not weather related, will be 45 minutes. You sit in that maze waiting to get to the toll plaza. Oh man! So yeah, this so is Stanford. Life to, yeah. So question yeah. for you. Um, so if somebody's listening to this and they kind of want to follow the progress, that sounds to me like you're still kind of you know you're still. Um, going up through your channel and your chains, um, but if they want to follow the progress of Plan 8182 or support it in any way or anything else, do you have any channels like that? I know most things you do are pretty stealthy, but I'm just, I'll throw it out there. Are there any channels or any ways that people can find out more information? Um, I do have a copy of the Plan 182 on my LinkedIn uh, page. So if you go to Stanford Crane on LinkedIn, you'll be able to see it. You'll, it's a PDF, so you can download and look at it. Um, I'm kind of breaking this news on on your show, and so this is the first time I've gone public with it. Oh, that's so exciting! I've got to figure out how I can make this a viral movement, because let's say you wanted to, you know, I'll, I'll do something crazy like you want to do uh, uh, do a small film. Okay, mm-hmm. nobody in Hollywood is going to give you the money for that film. Okay, now what happens when you do films? You pay staff, catering, transportation, all all of these things generate business activity. And this is why I'm so, I'm against globalization. I'm a localization person. And the key thing about Plan 182 is like when you get your money in that congressional district, it has to be spent in that district. So, So it is always local. It's always benefiting your neighbors. And then you get to know people. Like most people, they they can't tell you anybody you know who's within 200 yards of their home, so or their apartment. So this kind of brings right. the community together, and it allows people to support the community. The other thing it does on the next level. So the next level up is even a bigger level, and there are two of these uh, level two venture capital companies for every state, and. You know, some of the people, like one of the guys here from the California Congressional Office, said, well, that, that's not good for California because we're much bigger than Rhode Island. Well, why should Rhode Island or Wyoming get this money? And he said, because we want a federal system. We don't want a, a population-concentrated system. We want to be able to expand across the whole country. So, so in the next level – you get to invest much more money. And it may be, and it doesn't have to be a new business, it could be, mm-hmm. but it could be a business that has just fallen on hard times and, the, and they don't have the capital, working capital, nobody will invest in it because the reality is financial investors are totally risk averse, even though they're supposed to have already diversified their portfolio into here's my risk category, here's my risk averse category, here's my bond category, you know, which is, if, if you want to, uh, the only safe investment I know is, you know, U.S. Treasuries. Because if the U.S. government can't pay you, nobody's going to pay you. So, and that's why you get a 30-year bond yielding 3%. Think about that. Mm-hmm. And yet people buy them by the zillions. The bond market is many times bigger than the equity markets. Mm-hmm. But getting back to my idea there, so say you're a, uh, let's just say, uh, and the next level up is level three. That's that's a bigger number. Now, level three investors are, there are uh, two of them for the top 50 uh, population centers in the United States. So let's say you wanted to start a company in Detroit, okay? And you, and you wanted to produce, you know, some new kind of, vehicle. Nobody's, you know, I know there have been people who've done it, but they're rare, but nobody's really going to lend you any money. And so basically you you could go to, to a tier two or tier three and plan 182 and say, look, I've got this really good idea. I'm going to employ a thousand people. And that's about how many people World Moto Clash will employ not only directly, but indirectly the people who participate wow. in this World Moto Clash. And so that's a lot of people. And so that what is. do they do? They spend the money, and they spend money locally. So if you were U.S. Steel and you needed a level three loan, in, in, in the three years, level three uh, venture capitalists in Plan 182 
will invest or loan, uh, and I'll get to why it could be a loan, they can invest up to $900 million in three years. So that's real money. That could save a company that's having problems. And if you really look at it, what President Obama did with the auto bailout was essentially that. He bailed out these giant companies that had gotten behind the curve in their in their thinking and in their financial modeling, and he, he saved hundreds of thousands of jobs, which was good. Okay, but what what's, what about for the average person? You know, what, what about every young person would like to be an entrepreneur, but they don't know how. What if he could team up? What if he could go to a, a Plan 182 venture capital saying, look, here are some of my skills. Who do you have in the area that I could team up with because I want to do this? And that's part of their job. So we, we do a whole bunch of innovative things in Plan 182. It's, it's taken a long time for me to develop all the little intricacies about it. And if you think about it, the, the whole student debt program could be probably wiped out just because these people would now have something uh, basically that they could go and join a young company that would have access to capital in Kansas where they never had a venture capital investment ever probably, or Wyoming or Idaho or, you know, just pick the state. If it's not California, Texas, New York, Massachusetts, yeah. it's probably not getting funded. So Stanford, so, um, I, I I wish we could go into the whole plan today. I'll tell you that, um, and we're about out of time on this episode, and I might have to bring you back on another one um, as this gets further along because I do want to go further into it. I love what you're doing. I love what you're, what the goal is accomplishing. You're, I mean, you're tackling these. These are big problems you're going after. There's a big bite you're looking to take in this initiative, which I love. Um, so you mentioned the best way for somebody to get a copy of this and to learn more would be to um, that they can get a copy if it's posted on your LinkedIn profile. Is that the best route as of this point? Yeah, and, and anybody out there who wants to connect with me, I, I never turn people down really for connecting because that's what LinkedIn is for. I, I don't think I know everybody that I can help or everybody that can help me. And so. Awesome. So, well, hey, Stanford, you know. really, uh, really appreciate you coming back on the show and uh, been a great reunion episode and love what you're doing, man. You, you always bring something interesting to the show. So thank you for <laughs> that. And glad to glad to glad to see you breaking the breaking the news here. So we'll also appreciate that. Of course, we love the story. Um, and uh, to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. Um, if you did, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast, leave me a review, do all those great things we do to support our podcasters. Um, I really do appreciate it. And uh, Stanford, thanks again for coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure, Adam. Happy New Year.